to call the order, mm -hmm. but, but we can pause too. John's here. Oh, so there he is. All right. So it goes on. All right. It is 5 p.m. on this Tuesday, July 12th, 2022, for a regular board meeting of Santa Cruz Valley Unified School District, number 35. With that said, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Ms. Forbian, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Roll call. Mr. Brad Beach is attending a conference from what we were told. Ms. Susan Fobian. Present. Mr. John Hayes. Here. Mr. Rene Ramirez. Not here. And myself, Joel Kramer. So there are three members present. We do have a quorum for this board meeting. Moving on to adoption agenda. Mr. Purdue. Uh, no recommended changes. Thank you. With that said, then do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as posted? So moved. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor, please acknowledge with saying aye. 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 Passes 3 0. Call to the public. We have no calls to the public. Right along then to presentations. Going into Mr. Verdugo, Superintendent's report. Uh, thank you. Just a, a couple of items. I uh, want to congratulate uh, the Rayburg High School uh, baseball for the summer for winning the summer championship. So, congratulations to, to them. Um, also, wanted to uh, thank uh, the board for allowing us to hire students this summer. Um, they've been working really hard at assisting Dr. Lavelle in moving and um, assisting around the school district. So I wanted to thank them for all their hard work uh, this summer. Although they're getting paid, they're still working very hard in this, this heat. So I appreciate all of their effort. Um, I wanted to notify the board that uh, next week I will be attending the uh, West End uh, board meeting in San Francisco. So I will be out next week, uh, Monday, Thursday, and Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burr. Here we go. Subject B, governing board member report, Mr. Hayes. Uh, nothing to report, though. I did see the uh, mentioning of the, the baseball team's uh, win at the tournament, so congrats to them. All right, thank you. Ms. Fobie. Yes, um, looking forward to the 23rd for the Back to School Blitz. That's always a very exciting time when and the drive-by is you don't get as much interaction with the parents, but you get to see them and kids in the car are very excited about getting their little treasures that they'll use at home. And um, you know, I really want to congratulate the schools. They have continued with um, a lot of good Facebook posts with photos. And I think that just really helps the kids like stay in touch and have some things to look forward to when they come back. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, I have nothing to add. It'll just be very true. Baseball, that's hopefully that's the start of something special, I guess, right? From what we we're hopefully seeing. So that's good. All right. Item three, information discussion action. First read policy A I K I K A I K C. Mr. Verdugo, Mr. Shadler. Uh, thank you. Um, so tonight will be our first read um, of these policies. Um, again, when we revise a policy on our own, um, it goes through a first read, a second read, uh, and then approval. Um, and so tonight is our first read, and I've asked Mr. Shadler to uh, present um, policy changes. Um, I know he's consulted with Dr. Lemonville as well uh, to get some legal um, advice on that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Mr. Shadler. Thank you, Mr. Lito. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. And yes, uh, this has been a collaborative effort between the LA department, myself, and Dr. Lunderville. Um, and it's an ongoing process. And so um, this is, as Mr. Dugo explained, so we want to explain to you um, what's um, the details of what we're talking about. Um, you know that we've been discussing the um, trans-based learning and reporting as well as personalized and competency-based learning um, for a couple of years now. We're ready to make that transition. We're pulling up a 
PowerPoint here, so I'm just going to give them a moment if I may. Well, let me put it on screen. Click on slideshow. Jan's panel. There we go. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, so our, um, just a little, for a little bit of um, background, personalized competency-based learning uh, assignments are tailored uh, at around an event, a passage, uh, or a formula, or a whole class um, inclusion. And the reports uh, regarding student learning are assignment-based and in rank order based on the, the students in the class. What we're trying to do with personalized learning is the assignments are tailored around the state standards and um, the events, passages, formulas, et cetera, are really just teaching tools for that standard. So in my world as an English teacher, I'm not teaching Huckleberry Finn, I'm teaching state standards associated with literary analysis and Huckleberry Finn is simply my, my teaching tool. That makes sense. Um, so that's, that's, that's not a policy, that's just a, uh, a philosophical shift we're making in our, in our pedagogy. And, as you know, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now and trying to provide some updates along the way. Um, in terms of standards-based learning and reporting, um, currently, as you're very familiar, we have grades in an A to F format associated on a zero to 100 scale. And those grades communicate an average um, for the student's performance over the course of that grading period, typically a semester. Um, in SY23, that grading would transition to a zero to four proficiency scale. Uh, the proficient, proficiency numbers are basically shorthand symbols for the descriptors. We have extending, proficient, developing, and emerging. Um, and those, those four would replace the common, commonly used A through F. Um, the grades communicate more recent learning relative to an academic uh, standard. So what, what that all means is some of the problems, and this is now I guess speaking on behalf of education across the country, one of the, one of the problems we've tried to address as a as an institution for decades now is the, the current grading system um, waits the same waits a, a test the student takes in the first week of school has the same amount of points as they take on the ninth week of school presumably their learning has improved and grown but for the struggling student who hasn't learned everything in the first week yet there, there's no way for them to to balance and represent their current learning the other problem of averaging is you get an 84 percent in class well, that that's great but you've We've got countless examples. I got AAA and FFF. It averaged out to a C. I passed the class, but really, I haven't demonstrated any learning in 50% of the content. That, that's a problem from a communication point of view for the students and the parents. With proficiency, standards based proficiency, both of those issues are addressed because the, the, the system takes into account the most recent grade for the student. Um, and that idea of averaging the, the, the scores, the standard score is specific to the standards. So what I said before, AAA, FFF, now that student would get 444111. So now I know specifically the three areas that I've got ones in, I still need to keep working. Even though I have passed the class or we're moving on, I still know where my weak areas are. So those are just some philosophical differences between the systems. This is an example of what the proficiency scales look like, and there's a descriptor for each one. So I mentioned earlier, our categories are extending, proficient, developing, and emerging. Um, you'll notice no evidence yet. Um, it doesn't have a number, numeric value. It's not a zero. It's just that the student hasn't, um, hasn't demonstrated evidence of, of what their learning is. In other words, they've got missing assignments. Um, so we're having lots of ongoing conversations about what to do with a student who doesn't have um, evidence. But in the meantime, they're not getting punished with a zero when they may have been absent. They may have, you know, we all know there's all kinds of reasons why a student may not be turning in their work. But this is the proficiency scale that um, we've arrived at thus far. So in terms of policies, which ones are impacted by some of these shifts that we've been discussing? The first one is IKA. And I believe you have a, a written copy of that in front of you. Um, and this is where Dr. Lungo is instrumental in working with our attorney to make sure that we're obviously still passing or approving um, legal policies. What I have on the slides here are really just a summary for the sake of discussion, but as I said, you have the complete policy in your packet. Um, currently, IKA reads the written reports to the parents concerning student achievement we get every nine weeks. Um, in SY23, the formal reports concerning student achievement will be made every 18 weeks by the teacher. And additional progress reports will be made after the fourth, ninth, 
and 13th week of each semester. So by changing our calendar and by changing some of all this other stuff, the, the parents will still get four um, formal reports back, as, as we said there, at, at four, nine, 13, and 18 weeks, as opposed to a progress report, a quarter grade, a progress report, and a quarter grade. So it's still the same four reports, but the times of the semester in which they occur will, will change. Um, we're still on policy IKA. It shall be necessary to contact the parents of a student's progress falls to grade levels or is below 70%. I think we've had discussions with the board over the years about, about this. Um, and the, the, the recommended change will say it shall be necessary to contact the parents of a student who is not making progress on meeting course learning goals. Um, because once again, those percentages and those averages look different. So we won't be able to say, oh, you've dropped, you've dropped below 70%. We will now hold the teachers accountable for reporting to parents when the student is not making progress on meeting their learning goals. So again, the, the, the intent of the policy to provide parental, um, timely parental information is still present. And the last change that's still on IKA, teachers will report currently to parents on student conduct, scholarship, attendance, and, and tardiness. Um, there is no changes to that language in the, in the record. So I um, want to stop right here. We've got other policies to discuss, but on IKA specifically, can I may I pause here and, and entertain questions? Certainly, Mr. Hayes. So let me just make sure I understand, uh, Mr. Shadler. Um, they're going to be getting, still getting four reports per semester unit or whatever we're calling it now, uh, even though we're the mandate is instead of every nine weeks, every 18 weeks. Yes, the, the, yes to the first half of your question, you will still be getting the four reports. We've historically had a progress report, a quarter grade, another progress report, and then a semester grade. Semester. We will now have the reports, that, that, the same four reports, but they'll be at different intervals with only one semester grade coming at the end. And how much room is there if we go back to the, the proficiency scale? If we go back, like, I think it's like three three slides back. Oh, 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 can I go back? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, this one. Um, what sort of uh, indicators do we have or are we going to be able to give the student if like on say they're uh, uh they've got two subjects where they're a, a two and a one and on the the two they're just barely a two you know like a a, a 2.001 and on the one they're like a, a, a 1.99999 so that they're when when they're getting very close to those border levels how do we distinguish between those and how do we help the student understand when they're that close? So on our early release dates for the past two years, all of the content areas, and I mean literally all of them, K-12, foreign language to math and so on, have been working on what you see here in front of you is just our general proficiency scale. Every state standard in each content area has the same ranking or, or proficiency level saying for standard 1.2.3 in calculus, a four looks like this, a three looks like this, a two looks like this, and so on. And for okay. every standard 1.2.3 in third grade reading, a four looks like this, a three looks like this. So the students will be getting, I think, uh, if I'm change your question correctly, significant and very specific feedback all throughout. So they're at a 1.9, that it's a conversation to the teacher, you know, here's what a two looks like. How do I get to a two? Because I keep ending up with ones. Yeah, because I know this throws out a bunch of advice that uh, myself, few other pe parents and teachers have given kids over the years, especially when they're dealing with a class where it seems like it's more of a conflict with the teacher than it is with the, them understanding the subject. And it's more a matter of just figure out what the teacher wants and give the teacher what they want. It, this seems like it does away with this completely. Well, that's a very astute observation. Thanks for bringing that up. And, and yes, one of the, there were really two primary reasons for creating all those proficiency scales that I just described. One was to give the students clear feedback about what is expected to earn a four. 
but in all honesty, it was also to come up with some inner rate of reliability so all math teachers know exactly what a four looks like. And it's not that game of what does Mr. Verdugo want to see in the first period compared to what Mr. Shadow wants in the second period. So Beautiful. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Ms. Holman. No questions. Thank you. Our resident maestros are not here, and they would probably have had flooded you with questions, be it Mr. Beach and Mr. Ramirez. But nevertheless, I will ask this as a parent, as John was alluding to it. How is this going to show up when I log into our system and looking at the where my student lies in these proficiency levels? So we're, we're, we're modifying this report card, which has also been... Um, we'll, we'll still run through Synergy. We'll still get a Synergy report card. It will be a standards-based report card. And all the assignments will be there like it had been in the past with the teachers. The gradebook. He's Group. asking about viewing the gradebook. From well, online. When I'm logging in yeah. to see my child's attendance yeah. and or that. We invite like Ms. Padilla, who's both a parent and has been instrumental in this whole process, to come up and read again. Good evening, board president and members of the board. I, so when you log in as a parent, you'd be able to see the assignment, the standard associated to the assignment, and the score. Okay, so then it will, I guess, will the teachers then put all of it for the quarter, or how are they going to just add every assignment? It, it Once they've completed the assignment? So part of this is really like training ourselves on what is a reliable assignment slash assessment. If I just taught you something right now and ask you to produce something, I really shouldn't put that in the gradebook, right? Because I, you just started learning that. However, if you've had enough time and now I need to, you to show me what you've learned, that grade is going in the gradebook. So it's hard to say like black or white, will every single assignment go in the gradebook? That might be a lot when students are still practicing and learning and mistakes are expected. However, we can still in our grade books, we could enter any assignment we want and we have the option to put not for grading. So let's say I let's say a teacher still wanted to communicate how a student did on every single assignment along the way, they could indicate not for grading. It would not impact the student's overall academic grade, but the parent could see how their child has been doing on those practice assignments. And then the assessment on that standard would count toward that final academic grade because the student has had enough time to acquire the skill. Okay, and you, you, I'm sure that these questions, this type of question is going to be the number one question mm -hmm. of all of our parents and they're gonna continue asking and they're gonna continue asking and then they're gonna continue asking is, well, why is this one teacher got a list of 10 as opposed to this teacher only has two and we're already seven weeks into the Nine week period. Yes. Uh, again, now those are the questions I think the parents are going to be wondering because this is all new to them. Yes. They're not trained like our teaching staff. They're not trained like our students. A lot of them probably are going to be, what is this? And we get those questions right now too. And the uh, it's interesting, like a lot of the common concerns we'll get, it's like we get this right now and we constantly need to work on communicating and being clear is what most of it boils down to. Right. And so that's something that we're constantly working on. To the, to the point of, of, to the point of um, teachers are, uh, uh, excuse me, are the parents aware uh, they understand all this. We've been working throughout with, with the sites in terms of uh, the parents have seen this, they've provided some feedback on it. Um, we've had some focus groups and just letting them know this is coming, this is coming. So, you know, now, will there be people on August 1st who have no idea what we're talking about? Most likely. I'll do Let's be that. honest. 80% of the parents, parents Steve, 80% of the parents are going to be asking this. Your 20% that are participate right. are the ones that did it. Maybe 40% are, if we're going, yeah. Right. Half our parents have no idea that this is coming down. I agree. I'm saying that. No, I would agree. But I think also that those parents who have participated, once we've explained it, have all been very positive and receptive to the changes and, and see the clarity it's going to provide. And I would, I would use the word grateful. They're grateful to finally, oh, you'll finally tell me my kid is strong here and weak here instead of just saying he's getting a C. So when they're in their parent language, I think they are receiving the information very positively, those that are participating. And again, I'm not <laughs> throwing rocks. I'm being the pundit here of the devil's advocate. 
and looking at the other side of some of our parents that I remember parents, half of them did not always participate. Yeah, for sure. They're going to be going, what is this? Yeah. What is that? So hopefully we have good salesmen and women able to enunciate what we're trying to get across. Well, we anticipate sending, um, I don't know what the right word, like an ancillary or a guide, right? When that first progress report goes out, right? Here's what this means. This is a new format than what you're used to. When the report card goes out, um, probably I would say for the first few years, because it will be, it, it's a change. Well, the more we sell it, the more that we just put it out right away, not just wait till the progress report, put it out the right. beginning of the year, going out everything that we can, continue to sell, 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 sell. And I think related to this too, we've been doing student-led conferences for a couple of years now, um, and that will um, continue to feed into the understanding. And when, a, when a, the whole point behind that is when a student can lead that parent conference and say, well, here's where I'm strong at, and here's my portfolio, and here's over here in this corner is where I get extra help on these standards where I'm only a one. And believe it or not, like we've seen examples in our own district. We used to see them in other, you know, we go to trainings and see the kindergartner that could do that. And we're now seeing our own <coughs> third graders that can articulate their own levels of learning. And I think over time that will start to bleed into the <laughs> understanding of the parents about all of it. Yes. Yeah. Many, many, um, there's no silver bullet to what you're saying. You're absolutely right about the, um, questions we will still get. I'm just explaining that we've got multi, multiple um, strategies to try to address what you're discussing. Exactly, I, and again, I'm not, I'm just only looking at the other side of this, that the, some of the disgruntled parents that, well, I didn't know they, and that you know they're gonna use that. I didn't know, I didn't know. I appreciate you reminding me. I'm just saying that, you know, that I just hope we're prepared for that. They're not be being prepared, let's put it that way. Too. I appreciate the reminder. Thank you. And I think that they already asked those same questions, you know, to, to Ms. Bidia's point that I think those parents, like when they open, like, how do I get into the grade book? How do I do, how do I get into to Synergy? They ask those questions, even though we've given them their password 10 times and um, done those things. And, and it's not a negative thing. It's just, you know, right. this reality of, of working with, with parents because they, they're so busy. They're trying to, to be the best parents they can be um, and try to get into that. And they're going to ask those questions. So it's, I don't necessarily think it's a change. To be honest, it, it, it might eventually open up because it's about learning versus just the compliance. And I think that's the biggest shift that they'll be able to have those conversations with their child that, you know, what are you actually learning versus get your homework done, you know, because that, that is a, a, a big shift. Yeah. I'm just, again, I always try, not, again, I try not to, I, I'm, I'm poorly, I'm an optimist. But I always look at the what could happen side mm -hmm. and what's the negative aspects of this and what we're coming out of this COVID. As you know, we've had, and you guys know, we've had a lot of negativity that came in, be it the lack of discipline, the lack of effort, the lack of everything. Yeah. This is another change. So I'm just saying, I hope we're prepared yeah. for that that's coming in. No, I think we will be. And I, again, I appreciate you keeping us aware yeah, yes because I, i'm just saying you know for those of us that do go out we're probably going to hear some of that feedback so you know that we'll be giving you the feedback as well yeah. so that's for ika um, a few other policies that are sort of related to this conversation they, they don't all involve changes for example ikaa tests and exams um, this addresses our final exam process may be used as evaluation of student achievement when they are conducted in such a way that they effectively evaluate the achievement of the goals. Um, we have no recommended changes to this policy, so people are thinking what's going to happen to final exams and so on. The, the grading of the exams is, is not impacted by the, our ability to give an exam, so there's no policy changes recommended here. Um, IKAB, report cards, progress reports. As what we discussed earlier, parents will be informed regularly and at least four times a year as to the progress their children are making. So we're not changing this policy. We will still be meeting this requirement of four um, reports to the parents. IKC, class rank and grade point average. Um, currently, uh, which will continue for the class of 2025, because I don't know if I'm correct if I say this wrong, but when, when a high school freshman starts, um, the rules that are in place for that student remain with them until they graduate 20, uh, well, four years later. So 
for our current policy, which will continue for our current freshmen who are now sophomores until they exit the system, reads the total grade points begin accumulating in ninth grade. They're divided by total units, and that's how you come up with a GPA. And that's on a 5.0 scale to account for weighted grades. Um, the recommend, recommend, uh, recommendation um, for the change here, which would um, we'll be running two policies, I suppose, for a couple of years. Um, but the recommendation here is the total grades begin accumulating in ninth grade, no change. These are divided by total units attempted to produce the cumulative GPA um, with the scale goes to a 4.0 scale. So um, unless they are enrolled in advanced classes. Would it matter, Steve? I mean, as we know that the AP, even though it's a 5.0, when they get to universities, it goes back to regular anyway. That's, that's, that's another uh, education point for parents and students um, that um, a lot of uh, the, the argument is the class is harder, I, just, I should get more credit. Educators will say, well, that's fine, but the universities want to know if you pass the class. I personally asked an admissions officer um, at a pretty high ranking university. Um, do you would rather see a student who got A's in regular or B's in honors? And she said, I'd rather see kids get A's in honors. So I'm like, okay, well, that answers that question. They don't really distinguish between the AP and the regular. They want to see the best students challenging themselves the best way they can. I'm just saying as far as, G I wasn't just kind of counting the AP because I'm a big AP person, but I'm just saying the GPA. The some, yeah, it. some people think, or, I'll just say in my house in 2012, somebody thought she had a 3.6. She had AP classes. The regular GPA was a 3.4. Because again, ASU, U of A, NAU, whatever, they don't take the 5.0, they put, bring it back down. And that's what I was saying. Yeah, is, I, yeah. So it's not going to really, I think it's actually gonna kind of clean that up. Right, and, and this has been a, Source of discussion again. Uh, you know what I'm saying? The APB is still going to be a 3.0 as according to our regular, still a 3.0. Right. 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 Okay. So that's what I'm saying. It's kind of cleaning it up. So I think it speaks too to the transparency and reporting to families and parents and students about what <laughs> my kid really and um, those who understand the AP world have historically understood the GPA idea, the ranking idea, um, the inflated grade idea, but those who aren't in part of that world are wondering why is there a five and a four? Why, why? What do you mean that kid, you know, my student is here and this other student who's got lesser grades, but they leave far ahead of them. So it's, this will, I agree, clear up a lot of that confusion. Just wanted to pass the AP exam. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, because this is one of the copy, the policies that you have a copy of in front of you. I'll, I'll pause here and entertain some questions if there are additional. I just kind of intervened on that, I'm sorry. John, Mr. Hayes. No, I was just thinking back to how uh, a certain son of mine found out that he was in a speaking position at the begin beginning of his senior year and manipulated himself out of the speaking position for his GPA, so. I don't know if that's going to make this any easier to do or harder to do, but that's a mute point. I think it does make the understanding of the GPA um, much simpler, uh, keeping it at this, the one to four scale. Exactly. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Ms. Wolvian? No questions, thank you. Okay, then moving on. Um, the continuation. So at IKB, um, currently an honor roll system is an additional means for encouraging goal setting by students and for providing recognition of students. It's using grades four through 12. There is no change to the policy. We are having discussions in the regulation about what honor roll looks like. The different sites already currently have, you know, some call it the red and black honor roll, some call it the principal, high principal honor roll. And we have some different terminology that we use. We're trying to um, uniform, unify some of that, but that's a, that's going to be regulation only, but the policy there are no recommendations. For IKE, promotion and retention of students, year-to-year um, -year promotion of student grades one through eight will be based upon standards for each basic subject area. Uh, again, there are no changes here. There is, however, some discussion um, to determine consistent interpretation of standards mastery and what number of standards 
should determine promotion. So at the lower levels, we talk about retention. Um, well, to have that same conversation, but now retention based on he or she hasn't master hasn't demonstrated what a two, a three, a four. Are we going to start retaining kids who are anything less than four? I, I doubt it, right? But if they're all ones and a couple of twos, or mostly twos, but a few ones, so the conversation won't change, the policy won't change, but we need some conversation about how to interpret that. Um, the regulation associated with IKE, the, with the, this regulation will be modified to include notifying parents of possible retention no later than the end of the first semester with regular progress reports occurring twice prior. Um, currently, I think the policy reads that parents should be notified at the end of the first quarter. We no longer have a quarter on our school calendar. So the, the um, regulation will shift to say at the end of the first semester, but we will, we're not gonna spring that on parents the day before Christmas vacation, right? So we will still require, um, I can say warning, but you know, it, warning in uh, communication prior to that. But then the official <coughs> says, we are seriously considering retaining your child will be given at the end of the semester, which then drives further parent you know, conversations in the second, the decision's not actually made until April or early May. We want to let families know well in advance that we really need some serious intervention here to support this child. Um, IKEA is a policy governing makeup opportunities. The superintendent shall develop and implement standards that shall apply to requirements for students' makeup assignments during absence. Um, there are no recommended changes to this. So people have had some questions about. Um, you know, with the new grading, am I, what if I, if it doesn't do well in this class, can I, what, what if I get a one, can I still have a makeup opportunity? They never asked that question if you got a zero, but now they're concerned about getting a one. So yes, you can still have a makeup opportunity, there are no recommended changes to this policy. Uh, is, why specifically for pesticide yeah. applications and other appropriate reasons? Oh, because pesticide is the number one priority. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's, a really, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really large fine wow. if you don't notify. You know. Yeah. Um, the regulation associated with IKEA currently reads that if work is not turned in by the time the assignment is due, in one case, the teacher may reduce the grade on the assignment or withhold credit. Um, this is a regulation <laughs> yeah. now moving forward that uh, the student, uh, the work that's not turned in, will receive a mark of no evidence. And that's the part that I had explained earlier. So that's only in the regulation. Um, but I wanted to make that bring that to your attention. So then semester's cut off. December, first semester, before holiday break, Christmas break, whatever. Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the, the semester grade becomes the final grade and so on. But I, one of the, I would say, bonuses to this system is that I pass the class, but I still know that I'm at a one on this level. So in the second semester, my teacher and I, even if it's spring and I move into the next grade level, the teacher still knows that I'm on a one on that level. So I can continue to work on that skill. In our current system, I pass the class, I'm moving on. I'm in algebra two now. I'm not worried about algebra one anymore. I was saying like in first semester, mm -hmm. getting that. So, so the grade becomes official at the semester. Right, so it ends, there's the cutoff. Right. But the, but the student moves forward into the second semester and the teacher receives that student in the second semester with knowledge that they still need help in this particular standard. So presumably they would still address it. Okay, I just, okay, I'll make it more specific. 11th grade US history first semester. I get a two, that's my grade for that first semester. I earned a two, I don't get, I've earned that two. Well, okay, so I think, so now I think if I'm understanding, you were asking, could the student in the second semester go back and change First semester grade, if they've now demonstrated improved learning, right? Mastery. I went from a two to a four. Can I go back and change my score from that first semester? Um, there is a process currently for changing grades. Um, I don't know how often that's done. I don't know, is the, in terms of demonstrating most recent learning, has the committee had any discussions about? No, because what we would consider at, in December for semester one, we would consider this is your most recent learning. You get a report card. We're starting semester two. Now, not every course is the same. If that standard is going to keep going or repeat, then yeah, I would hope to see that kid go from the two to the three, right? Well, and then, but it might be a whole, they might start on new standards. And so now we're reporting on the learning for that semester. What's in our scope and sequence for that semester? As I said, for US history, 
11th grade. So I got a two that first semester. That two is the permanent record for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to raise that up. Now I can move the standards up and get better, obviously, Correct. just like anything else. Yeah. Right. And then for just like if it was a grading scale, I got a C for a semester. Doesn't mean I'm going to get an A second yeah, we'll semester, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Now that we're on this, how does that impact the final grade? Well, right I, was now, there is there a final final for the both first and second? So for next school year, this is for K eight. So for high school, our high school task force, we're looking at what goes on for final grades. So I can't address that question yet. For like if you had a two, then a three, right? Semester one and two, yeah. semester two, a three, and then what's the final grade? So that's what we're having, gonna have discussion. Well, it doesn't really matter. Final grade's not gonna matter because it goes by semester anyway for your locking in your half credits. So final grade's not gonna impact. <clears throat> I guess that's for inter actually it's irrelevant. Because it's not going to end. Mr. It will. Mr. President. Because if you get a first semester, hold on, John. Quarter. Well, I'm just going first semester. Mm -hmm. Book art, two, right? Mm -hmm. Second semester, you get a three or four. You're not changing that first semester. No. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So again, the final grades aren't impacting that first semester. There, there is no final. There's one final grade, right? Sorry. There's still two semesters. Yeah. There's yes. two semesters instead of four quarters. But well, I'm not calling, I'm quarters. looking at quarters. Again, I was thinking, grade. I don't think in quarters, I think in half in semesters. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying for semester. Because again, that I'm talking high school, I wasn't talking K-8 okay. so much, because K-8 can, you've got a lot more leeway. Yeah. So you're, you're, Certainly. You're putting things forward for the high school as the committee continues, they have another year to really drill down Again, you're, you won't be the only person who thinks about such a shadow. I apologize for my poor shot. <laughs> so, no, we've got a, a year to, to but see that that's going to, right. And again, yeah, I can see where K through eight, it's not going to be so low as it is just eight. Did Mr. Hayes have a question? Yes, he did. And I'll, re I'll relent the floor now, Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Mr. President. Actually, my question was kind of directed at you because I was a little confused by your question regarding you get a, a, a two in US history first semester uh, when what we're, what's on the screen is talking about assignments. So I was just a little, uh, I, I wasn't seeing the, the necessary connect, uh, contextual connection between your question and what we've seen within the last few slides. Yeah, I just, like I said, I jump ahead. Okay. I don't get locked into one thing. Conceptualize here, Mr. Hayes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, almost done here. Um, IKF graduation requirements, uh, minimum number of units of credit are required for graduation by the Arizona State Board of Ed, and there are no recommended changes to graduation requirements. Continue the same number of credits and so on. And that is, in fact, the final slide. So if there are any um, final questions, I can continue. No questions. Clear. Thank you. Look forward to launching it. <laughs> Us too. Thank you. Praise. No other questions. Thank you. Well, I just yeah. Thank you. And again, just want to all good you. though. All good. The sites in the daily office. So this is a lot of work has gone into this. I think you can see that. So thank you. Thank you. And then again, this is a first read, so we'll be bringing it back. Um, for a second read, just one final review, and then asking the board to approve at that point. Uh, for approval. Yes. Okay. Subject B, COVID-19 update, Mr. Verdugo. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a request from uh, Mr. Ramirez at our last meeting uh, to sense that there was uh, some movement with the COVID-19 cases in the county with the uh, brief update. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Dr. Lumberville. Um, good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. Um, I do not have a lot to update. Um, I did ask the county if they are going to begin to release um, case information again like they used to. They used to provide us with an update every morning. Um, so I'm making that request back to the health department. Um, the district is currently working with the health department to schedule vaccine days. Um, you'll probably see those going out 
um, across social media. Um, at the welcome meet your teacher day, a lot of the sites are going to have COVID vaccine and boosters um, as an optional station for families that would like to do that. Um, we'll also have some routine vaccines available that sometimes impact our students' attendance and enrollment. So we're excited about that. Um, in terms of our COVID-19 protocols, um, I continue to work with the business office to make sure that um, we have a stock um, in stock PPE and we'll continue to do that. Um, our cleaning and disinfecting um, habits and protocols have just become part of how we operate now. Um, we have not scaled that back or changed that. Um, the only thing that we have changed um, in, in general is the um, sort of mass sterilization of a room if someone were to test positive. Um, we still have the power breezers available, but because of um, CDC recommendations, we don't have to shut rooms down anymore if people are vaccinated in those rooms. So um, I'm not sure if there's anything else specifically that you'd like me to cover. Um, I know the board member. Who yeah, I just, uh, it's not even a side note, uh, speaking of power breezers, you know, one of the things what we invested in those was for mitigation as well, but also for cooling. And we were able to utilize those in transition cooling. So they were actually really in the district for use on fields or in, in the warehouse, things like that. That uh, you know, when people talk about that, because those are, you know, they, they are, you see them on NFL sidelines and things like that for those events. And so it's been an opportunity for us to utilize them in different ways. So it is still part of COVID, but it, it also allows us to cool down some rooms and utilize those as well. The questions that we've answered. I never even had my mic on. Ms. Fulvian. Are we making it a requirement yet for children coming into the district to be vaccinated? Um, that, that is, we cannot do that. So that was okay. part of the legislation. So, so we are following all of the state uh, guidelines and, and legislative initiatives. Mr. Hayes. No other questions. Thank you. These guys that are not here, Mr. Myers. All right, well, then I'll jump into it a bit. All right, so with that said, what's going to be our policy if, because we were given kits by our us as taxpayers, you could get them for free. We have kits as well. I had nine total kits that I got for free at my home. Um, and I'm going to make this personal because I want to just say how this will happen and what's going to transpire if I were a teacher. Go to a Diamondbacks game. You go with your family. You spend time with your family. And you come back and, and this now turns turn around is about two days. You turn around and you're feeling just you know a little bit odd, but you think it's allergies and stuff. And you test yourself at home and you test positive. You don't go to anywhere because everybody's got kids now. What's going to be our policy? Because I'll make this that, I mean, I'd still work in a different county and for their, what they're doing is, you know, I could have just avoided it and just went to work and nobody would have known. I could have said like everyone else, just allergies. It's a cold, no real symptoms, nothing of showing, no coffee, not like the first phase was <laughs> all the dry coffee and, and everything else. You hear people sneezing, but it really is just that. And it was actually, I've had allergies worse than what I've had this last phase. It wasn't bad at all. And if I don't report it, and I just say it's allergies because I've had allergies, I just come to school. You know, what are we, what are we as a district going to do with that? Because really, I mean, that's the that's where we're at now. It's it's getting to the point where it's just really mild. Uh, I'll just, and again, I'm opening on this up, not trying to be too personal, but my son, where he works, he was only out three days. They said, come on back. You're feeling well? Okay, come back. The current recommendation for those who um, are, it, are are not vaccinated is, is a five-day. Um, if you are vaccinated, it, it, there's just, you know, the different CDC guidelines. Um, and in general, Mr. Kramer, um, if we see students, of course, we can refer them to the, to the, Health office, and we can test them. Adults, it's a, it's a little different. If you, we were, Miss Kito's 
know if she's here. Um, I, there, there are some specific, I know, things that were allowed um, or that were permitted to request from employees if they're displaying symptoms. If they're not, then it's just kind of, I, I don't have an answer for you. I don't, we don't really police. If someone is, is legitimately presenting symptoms and we are going to continue to push out, you know, if you're not feeling well, we can test you, you can test, that sort of thing. But I guess I don't have an answer in terms of what we would, how we're going to monitor all of that. That would. Yeah, and I, again, I'm just bringing that up because again, we've gone through whatever, 30 years of, 40 years of having colds, going, getting through the colds, just come to school, you go to colds, teachers, we know that more in the days you have a cold. Yeah, okay, because that's where it's at right now. And I'm saying that because that's where it's at. I know, but I'm concerned is, okay, all of a sudden these, everybody's got colds, we start testing all the kids, are we going to shut down school again? Are we going to shut the district down because of this, the way it was just because it's just colds? I can tell you that we, we, have, we continue to, we, we do have employees who continue to report symptoms and they're at home, but I, I don't, of course, I don't want to close the school down. I don't, think there's, I don't think there's an easy answer for that at this point because we would have to follow the, the guidelines and see what, you know, whether it would be uh, an outbreak, you know, it was considered a formal outbreak. We'd work with the, the county to determine that and then decide whether we were going to shut down or not. No, I know, but I'm uh, okay. Let's go back. We've had colds and flus. We've gone through it for 30 some years, I'll say, since I've been here, 32 years. We've had colds and flus. Everyone's coughing, everyone's sneezing. We didn't shut school down because it was colds and flus. These, where it's now, the variants of these have gotten to that point where it's like a cold or flu. A question, and I'm not trying to hold here and say, yeah, we're, oh yeah, we're gonna, but uh, is the county going to step in and say, well, you know what? You do have a high number. You guys probably should shut your school down. And we would, we would determine at that point. I mean, that's like we've always done. I mean, we, we've always tried to follow the, the process of what's, you know, case by case situation, school by school situation, classroom by classroom situation. We've never really jumped on the bandwagon that we're going to shut everything down like some districts have. No, oh, I, I know. I'm just, I, I just want, again, I'm looking out because I know how this could be. Yeah. And the thing is, we're, we're always encouraging, and that hasn't changed that if you're not feeling well, don't, don't come um, because that's, you know, whether it be a cold or flu, you still don't want to spread the flu. You know, there's other things that, that uh, mm -hmm. you know, are, are part of that as well. And, um, but we, we, again, we'll have a common sense approach. I think that's one of the things that I would, I would say is that our district has been very common sense of what is out there. How do we address that? And, and again, case by case situation. And then sometimes we agree hundred percent with the county and other times we, we disagree. And so we, we again, look at all of the facts and, and determine what's best for our district uh, on a case by case situation. Ms. Gibbons, I don't know if you're going to respond for any of that. No, I... Good evening. No, I, I was going to basically say the same thing. All we can really do is provide information um, to the public and um, take everything on a case by case basis. You're right. Again, again, I, I guess I'm looking at it is this is now gotten the variant has gotten down to where it's like a cold and flu. And before in the past, we treated the colds and flus. Oh, you just have the sniffles. So you just have a cough. Yeah, but I'm feeling good. I'm drinking a lot of vitamin C and drinking a lot of juice and all that. And people go to work. People come to school. Kids have runny noses. They come to school. Correct? That's how I'm saying, okay, in the past, that's how we treated it. Now, where we're at now, we're not treating it the same because it's from what it was two years ago, it's not the same. Science, show, obviously, it's shown that. And that's why I'm wondering where we're at with that. Because I, I'm pretty sure once we get school in session, it's probably going to take off. Absolutely, I think that there, there's going to be, I mean, it's, it's shown every time, it, I mean, just even the, the cold and flu season, you know, you, you see the, the uptick in all of those things. And so, and again, we'll be prepared as, with as many mitigation strategies as we possibly can and then determine what's best for the district at that point. And we'll always try to be plan ahead for any contingencies. Right, I just, again, it's, 
I'm hoping that, that you know, we look at it through the perspective of now, not the past. Right? That's, I guess, what I'm trying to get. Absolutely. And if you're fully vaccinated and you're in school, there's still no quarantine requirement. So, right. So then, exactly. Anyway, it, it's like a cold and flu. Hopefully, we look at it that way. I guess that's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Landrill. All right. So we're at proposed and prioritized topics and possible dates and times for future board meetings. Mr. Verdugo. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things that uh, we did not do uh, in our previous meeting that I would like to uh, ask the board to do uh, is have a possible telephonic virtual board meeting on Tuesday, July uh, 19th, uh, because we still have hires that will we're process it. Um, so that's our last real opportunity before school starts and teachers start to report on that Friday. Um, so if we can um, have a uh, special meeting uh, for hiring on July 19th, um, we would appreciate that. So that would be an action item to have. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what uh, your on your action. Yes, yeah, so it, and then there's there's other items there as well. Um, you know, our next board meeting, and then um, the possible site session, we're still reviewing that. So the only action item tonight will be uh, to um, have a telephonic virtual board meeting on Tuesday, July 19th, if the board would uh, approve that. All right. So this is that. This is also discussion. So, Mr. Hayes. Um, one item that I've been thinking of recently is I'd like to know what our, uh, an update on the construction, especially of the pool and the plans for how we're going to get students trained to be able to be able to be hired as lifeguards at the pool, both, uh, during, uh, say an open swim session or during the course of the year, maybe even offered as a class. I'm not sure. Yeah, we can add uh, construction update. Yeah, we haven't seen our friends from Phoenix in a long time. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Hayes. That's it. Thank you. All right, Ms. Fobian. Yeah, update on all the construction would be welcome. Certainly. All right, I have nothing to add. So with that said, then, do I have a motion to approve the telephonic Virtual board meeting on Tuesday, July 19th, 2022 at 8 a.m. So moved. Second. Mr. Marshall, any further discussion? Okay, none else in favor, please acknowledge by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All right, consent agenda. Any matter on the consent agenda will be removed from the consent agenda and discussed as a regular agenda upon the request of any board member. Do I hear any requests from any board members? No. All right. Do I hear then approval of the consent agenda as is on this agenda? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please acknowledge by saying aye. 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 All right. Governing board meeting evaluation. Mr. Hayes, excuse me. Um, just a couple of uh, things. One nice short meeting. Uh, very informative, appreciate that. Uh, on the sound, there are certain people um, who are coming in loud and clear and certain people in positions that are very echoey and difficult to hear. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Verdugo is one of those. Probably my low voice. <laughs> it's either that or it's reverb, reverb slash echo in the room somehow. But also the same thing at the podium. Uh, and uh, both um, Dr. Linderville and Mr. Shadler are also a bit echoey on the, on the uh, audio. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, that's great feedback, Mr. Hayes. Oh, unintended. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that said, then it is uh, 5.50. 5.56 p.m. 
and it is July 22nd and this meeting is adjourned.